Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the uh, penultimate lecture in the, uh, the fall transportation lecture series uh, we're having here in these two transportation studies. And uh, uh, we're, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. Not only is it the day before uh, a major national holiday, it's also, I don't know what this stuff is out there, but it, it's, it feels wet. And, and it's something that I used to. I was telling Joshua that I actually did have a student write me a few years ago and say, are we still having class today? <laughs> uh, which I think is a very Southern California kind of question. I, I don't imagine in Portland State, for example, they had that, that question very much. Uh, so our speaker today is, uh, is Joshua Shane, Dr. Joshua Shane, who is uh, the uh, um, the director of the Office of Extraordinary Innovation at LA Metro. Uh, he has now been in Los Angeles for four years uh, after spending uh, uh, much of his his, uh, his his life and career on the the northeast uh, in the northeast in Boston and New York and uh, and most recently in Washington, where he worked uh, uh, for Senator Hillary Clinton. Uh, where he wrote a book about sort of the politics of surface transportation finance called All Roads Lead to Congress, uh, where he uh, had a leadership role in the Bipartisan Policy Center, and his last role was as executive director of the Eno Center for Transportation, which is one of the oldest transportation think tanks in the country. Um, so he has uh, joined us here in LA and has led uh, Metro in a lot of innovative programs to think sort of differently about how they function internally and also about how they engage a lot of the things that we're talking about in these classes, new proprietary <coughs> services that were just not on the, the map before and things to think strategically about how Metro does that. So without further ado, uh, uh, Joshua has amended his title slightly to say how to make money moving people around cities. Hint, best of luck. Uh, Joshua Shen. All right, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Brian has asked me to talk about uh, new mobility and how we're working uh, with new mobility providers. Um, in particular, for this presentation. However, at the end, I'm going to take questions and you want to ask about anything we're doing at Metro or the Office of Extraordinary Innovation. Happy to, to talk about that. Um, I do want to make sure that you all know that the Eno Center for Transportation is definitely the oldest transportation think tank in, in the United States. Not because there are no other transportation think tanks in the United States <laughs> that I'm aware of. And so, and we've been around for, for almost 100 years. Um, but the, um, the reason I came to Los Angeles to take this job is that I had a tremendous opportunity after working both um, in academia and in, uh, in Congress where I was talking about big ideas and trying to get big policy changes through to come and do something that's actually happening now and on the ground and solve a challenging transportation problem in the place with probably the most transportation problems in the United States. So that seemed really exciting to me. And I had a CEO who was creating this new office and empowering it to do all kinds of new stuff and try new things, um, which was a great, great experience uh, after the first two years. <laughs> so the first two years were very, very challenging. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those challenges today. Uh, because when you come into an organization and you're the innovation office, essentially your job is to tell other people why they're not doing their job as well as they could. Uh, and it's not earn you a lot of friends uh, very quickly. And it's an 11,000 person organization that I work in um, with many people who have been there many years who are very good at their jobs. And but really, I didn't know that much about what they were doing. And yet I was going to come in and tell them uh, how to do it better. So we ran into some of that on, on new mobility. And for the purposes of this presentation, when I say new mobility, I really mean private mobility providers um, that are out there using, essentially using smartphones and what is provided by smartphones to enable new transportation services. So we think about things like the transportation network companies, ride and companies. We think about uh, bikes and scooters that you can now use by getting your phone out. Um, and we even think about things like Postmates uh, and uh, freight delivery that is enabled uh, by the fact that you have a smartphone. And so the reason I've, I've titled the talk this way is that 
I think it is critical to remember that there is a lot of history behind trying to make money in transportation, and it is not a good history when it comes to those who are seeking the profits. Um, there are many, many challenges, and I'm going to talk about some, some of them, to making money in transportation. This is, of course, the, the red Pacific Red Car, and, and, and if you're not familiar with it, this was a, a very extensive uh, transportation network in uh, Los Angeles. And they uh, were started in 1901. They did make some money, um, not much, but they made some, mostly um, with freight and real estate, uh, not with moving people. And moving people was not a way that they were able to make money. And as such, you know, the other businesses weren't great either and eventually dried up. And this is what happened. You've probably seen this iconic photo. So that didn't really work out. Well, you can say, all right, well, you can't make money with mass transit. I, I get that. You know, that's hard. Um, but couldn't you make money uh, with tolls? Uh, you know, toll, tolls, tolls could make money. Well, yes, tolls can make money. This is a picture of the, the Triborough Bridge, uh, which was a really great money maker, for those who are not familiar with it, um, connecting three boroughs in, in uh, New York City, and built by Robert Moses, and a cash cow that enabled Moses to use that money to build many, many other infrastructure projects. Well, what's critical about this is that this was built by the government. And the government owned it and operated, and still operates it today. And so while it might have been a source of revenue, uh, to say that it is a way of pri for the private sector to make money is not true. It is a way for the government to bring in revenue. And there's a big difference between government-owned monopolies and the private sector new mobility providers that you're seeing out there today. right? And we're going to get into more of that. Um, and you can say, well, all right, so government, I get that. You know, government-owned monopolies can make business money, but, but aren't there private sector uh, mass transit systems that make money, and, and yes, there are. You may be familiar with the, the Hong Kong um, system. It is private. It is profitable. Um, their fare box recovery ratio is insanely high. So those who aren't familiar with that term, that's how much money you're collecting uh, versus how much money you're spending on, on each uh, rider. And and the uh, you know ours here in Los Angeles is less than 20 percent, right? Um, and theirs is about 180 percent. So that's a very big spread. Um, and it is true that it is private and profitable, but if you are a new mobility provider, some things to keep in mind about this system and how they got that way. One, it was built with public funds, so the capital investment was not from private sector investors looking to get their return on their investment. It was from taxpayers um, who, were, who were paying uh, to build this. Um, it also has the advantage of serving an island that uh, has very limited options when it comes to transportation, and is effectively a monopoly on public transit uh, within that island. And guess where they make most of their money? Real estate. So it's not really a great example for the new mobility providers to think that they're going to emulate the Hong Kong transportation system. That's probably not also not going to happen either. You say, well, what about city bike? City bike makes money, right? City bike, for those not familiar, is the bike share system in New York. And it had some challenges uh, from a financial standpoint at one point, but now it is actually operating with zero public subsidy. And it is, uh, it is quite successful uh, by any measure of, uh, from an economic perspective. Well, there's some reasons to, to keep in mind, right? It is also something of a, a monopoly. Uh, you cannot come along and put in a competing bike share system in New York. Uh, that is uh, that has docks. You're just not going to be able to do that. And in fact, New York isn't really allowing um, dockless uh, systems either. So you you have something of a monopoly. Um, it is using public land. Uh, the, the the docks are use, are using public land. Uh, but most critically, it is a government contracted operation. Right. This is not city by coming in and saying, oh, let's see if we can operate in New York and make money. This was New York saying, we want a contractor to do this, and we don't want to have to pay, but we'll give them land, and we'll give them monopoly, but they should, they should be able to do this on their own. And they've been able to do it largely because of the sponsorship of Citibank. Um, so the, the revenues from fares are not what's supporting this fully. It's the fact that they have a major sponsor that has, so at least sees that it has tremendous benefit from this. So. Not a lot of examples so far of transportation that makes money. Here's one that we're doing. So we're, we're also believing that this could be possible, right? So for those who aren't familiar with the Office of Extraordinary Innovation, one of the things we do is we accept unsolicited proposals 
from the private sector for new ideas, things that we should be doing. And we've received over 200 unsolicited proposals since we started. One of them was for this, which is an aerial tram between Dodger Stadium and Union Station. Uh, this is proposed to be built completely privately. Um, and it is, so we're not putting any public funds into this. We are going to do the environmental work for to clear the project, but we are being compensated for that environmental work. So it is not uh, public, public funds are not being used for that either. Um, and it is uh, intended to cover its costs uh, through revenues on the, on the trend. The, the folks who are building this believe that they can do that. So this is, this is an interesting question, is does this change everything? I've just told you all the reasons why you can't make money in transportation, and yet here is a, a private transportation provider uh, trying to do that, and we're believing that it can happen. Well, a couple things to remember. One, we're believing it can happen in the sense that we're allowing them to do this, but we have very little invested in whether they make money or not, because we're not spending public money. So if, they, if it turns out that they build this and they can't make money, it's really going to be more of their issue than ours. It might be that we have to take it over and there might be some loss uh, to the public if that's the case. So that yes, that is a risk, but it's perceived as a rather low risk. And secondly, that their real plan for making money off this is from real estate, because they believe that they can develop land around Dodger Stadium um, and make money off of that. So again, it is difficult to make money moving people. Um, one of the reasons that they think they can cover their costs of operations, at least, through the revenue is that they're not talking about using this as a mass transit vehicle exclusively, but rather mixing it with both mass transit purposes and tourism purposes. And people will pay more for tourism than they will for the daily commute. So again, lots of things mixed in in order to make uh, private transportation profitable. So when we come down to the list of historically profitable urban transportation services, not a big list, right? We've got government contracted services, which I think you know, can potentially be profitable for the private sector uh, entity that's providing them. And that's the end of the list. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit um, today about, uh, about why that is. And then I'm going to talk to you about how we're dealing with that fact. Right? Because right now we're, we're, we're still in this period of time when you're having a tremendous number of private sector transportation providers uh, coming into cities. And we're starting to see that push back a little bit. We're starting to see some of those companies realize that you can't make money in, in transportation. But um, it is still a period in which we're sorting out how much the smartphone is changing transportation. And our office is a big part of figuring out what that looks like. So let's talk a little bit about why it's so difficult to make money. We've touched on some of these things. Why is it difficult to make money? Well, I've come up with a few reasons. One is that the policy and profit motives are widely divergent. So if you think about um, the motive of profit, it's rather simple. People, investors are out there, they're putting in money, they hope to get a return on their investment um, through a business model that is successful. Policy motives are very different. We struggle with this all the time um, at Metro because <laughs> People are constantly giving us new policy reasons that we need to do something, right? Right now, we're spending, we're planning to spend a, a, a tremendous amount of money investing in electric buses because uh, our board members have decided that's a policy initiative that they care about. Now, if you're going to actually try to do something about climate change, you can find many, many better ways to invest that money than in electric buses, right? Um, that's actually a very inefficient method of, of addressing climate change. But we've been given that policy direction nonetheless, for various reasons. And policy direction doesn't have to be right. It just happens to exist. So we're constantly getting directions like that. In the case of the New York City subway, which is what I put up here, um, it is critical to remember that the New York City subway, which opened in 1904, um, <clears throat> had charged uh, five cents to ride the subway. It was a nickel fare. From 1904 through World War II, Every single mayor who ran for election in New York ran on the platform that included keeping the nickel fare. So they were uh, judging, whether it was right or not, that if they didn't include keeping the nickel fare as a critical part of their platform, that they would not win, a, win election. Um, and all the successful mayors who won did 
say they would keep the nickel fare and did in fact people keep the nickel fare. So there's some evidence that they were right, that that was a good policy platform for them to win re-election. Um, well, of course, there was 267% inflation during that time period. So when the nickel fare was still being charged in 1948, this was not helpful for the private sector transportation companies that were running uh, the subway, and there were two of them at that time. And they went out of business. Those subway systems, which were privately constructed and privately operated for those first 50 or so years, um, were making money mostly on real estate. And the fare, the inability to raise the fare, was a tremendous challenge to their financial bottom line. Um, now, I'm not saying that if they had raised the fare, uh, they would have necessarily stayed afloat. But my point is that the policy and profit motives were completely divergent at that time. And this is one of the challenges you have when you've got privately operated transportation services. So just so we think about some of the policy motives that will often come in that are legitimate policy motives. And I would argue that nickel, keeping a nickel fare was not necessarily great policy. But there are other much more legitimate policy motivations that we are dealing with all the time that keep the private sector from making money, right? One of them is we want to make sure that people who are disabled have ability to use transportation services. That costs money. The private sector is typically not inclined to make to spend that extra money to ensure that disabled people can do it, uh, can use their services, because the incentive from a profit standpoint to do that is very low. High cost, not a lot of benefit. But the law says they have to do it, and we, as a government entity, would, would certainly want them to comply with the law. So that's a good example of where costs are going to increase because of policy. Um, another good example is safety, which is a, always a critical uh, externality that people get concerned about when private sector is operating transportation services. For example, when the airline industry was deregulated, the big concern was, well, if they're not regulated, will they just you know, skimp on safety investments and then people will die, um, and this is not a good policy. And the, in that case, what we found was, was that that was not true, um, largely because there was so much profit motive for them to maintain a good safety record that they actually had tremendous incentives to do that because of the attention paid to airline crashes. And in fact, air, airlines that, that did not uh, pay attention to safety and had crashes went out of business. Now, is that a, an acceptable way of having the market regulate safety? You could argue about that, but the fact is that the market did regulate safety in that case. But when it comes to urban transportation, that's a lot more difficult because we already accept a tremendous amount of death and injury in our urban transportation systems. It's a really very high tolerance for that. So you would think that this would mean that the that you know the the, the safety would be less of an issue. Uh, when it comes to allowing private mobility providers out there. But in fact, what we're seeing is the opposite. What we're seeing is that when scooters and bikes come in, the first thing people are asking is, well, what's the, what's the impact on safety? When autonomous vehicles come in, the first thing people are going to want to know about is, well, what's the impact on safety? And that's because while we might tolerate a high level of uh, lack of safety in our existing system, that doesn't mean that we're then willing to say, well, we can add more to that. Um, or perceive that we're adding more to that. And the government is called upon to make sure that we, that we don't. And then finally, uh, the issue of low-income people and equity comes up as a policy objective. Um, you don't typically see uh, private sector companies investing a lot in making sure that there's equitable access, right? That's not going to be a real profit benefit for them to make sure that low-income people have access to their product, typically. Um, and for government, one of our key objectives often is to make sure that people have equitable access, and particularly in mass transit world, where we see a lot of our goals as being providing access for those who don't otherwise have it in the transportation world. So when it comes to companies like uh, Uber and Lyft, who they aren't going to likely care about um, people who are uh, disabled, uh, whether they even have access, they aren't going to really care about whether low-income people have that access. We feel responsible for stepping in and trying to deal with some of those things, that's going to add cost to their bottom line. So here's another reason that existing options that are out there are highly subsidized. So when you're coming in with a private sector transportation uh, idea, you're going to be competing against subsidized options, right? One of them is the roads, which we put a tremendous amount of investment into and, and don't really charge enough for. 
And then, of course, mass transit itself, which is, as I already mentioned, uh, very highly subsidized. So if you're coming in, you're now competing with these modes that have artificially low uh, fares. And, and it's interesting, the, the, the new mobility providers have tried to do that, deal with that by, by trying to have very artificially low fares themselves. And I think that these cartoons that I've, I've found kind of illustrate the difference, right? So this is, this is death waiting to go into a, a hospital room and, and uh, the tax guy asking if he can go in first. Just a reminder of the fact that, that taxes uh, tend to be something that don't go away and that the government will seek from you until the last minute, which is very different from the, the vulture capitalists we have um, on this side, because the vulture capitalist um, is not going to exist forever with an endless supply of money to subsidize your service, right? At some point, they want to see that return. They're going to pull out when they get it, and you are going to be left with a transportation company that is not make money and it has artificially low fares. So yeah, for those who don't know, Measure M, as an example, which is the, the, the tax sales tax that uh, we uh, approved and 71% of the voters approved in 2016 for LA County, does not end. There's no sunset to that. Um, and in, in the history of uh, taxation, it, it is rare to see taxes removed once they're put in place. That's just, that's just public policy um, uh, tendency. Uh, because when the taxes are put in place, elected officials see a lot of benefit to using that revenue for things that will get people to vote for them. And they're not going to just all of a sudden get rid of that unless some movement occurs to do so. So it's much harder to get rid of uh, those subsidies than it is to get rid of the venture capital subsidies. Um, if you own vehicles, they get expensive. This is a lesson that I think some new mobility providers are just starting to learn uh, because the, when you start out, when Pacific Electric started out, they probably didn't see a tremendous cost to maintenance. Um, and similarly, when you start out as a new mobility provider, you might not see a cost to maintenance. But um, as time goes on, that maintenance cost becomes more acute. And you start to realize that if you don't invest, things like this happen, right? The, uh, this is the OFO uh, bikes, which um, were presented as a dockless bike share system that uh, was just all of a sudden everywhere it cost a buck to use and was uh, was tremendously beneficial and was going to replace uh, publicly subsidized bike share that we have today. Um, and just to point out that uh, as, an, as an unsolicited proposal uh, uh, in office where we're, we're bringing in new ideas, just to point out that we're often wrong, um, we had an idea from one of these dockless providers that said, hey, why don't you just put in dockless bike share for us? We'll do it for free. Don't do your publicly subsidized bike share that you're about to do in Venice. Instead, do ours. It'll be free. What have you got to lose? And people who are wiser than me in the organization said, let's not do that uh, because we are about to put in our own bike share system. And these guys are just trying to undercut that because they're trying to compete with another uh, provider that won this contract. And they were absolutely right because that provider that was saying to do that went out of business. And now we have a bike share system in Venice. And the, 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 I think the, the lesson there is that um, it is difficult, very difficult, to maintain vehicles, uh, whether they're bikes or anything else, in a way that allows you to make a profit off of them. Because maintenance costs go up over time. Um, we might be seeing the same thing with Jump Now, uh, the, the uh, electric e-bike provider, which, by the way, I love and I think is just fantastic service um, and I wish would continue to exist. But they're starting to see the same challenges because these things cost money and they cost money to maintain and they've got to generate enough revenue within that time period that they've got them out on the street uh, to compensate for all those costs. And they're starting to see just how difficult that is. And, and in the transit business, we could have told them that uh, very easily because of the tremendous amount of money that we put into maintenance of our vehicles all the time. And just a couple more examples. You may have been familiar with the chariot and bridge. These are. Uh, private sector micro transit providers that have since gone out of business and they purported to put these types of vehicles out on the street, pull a lot of people in them and then bring them to uh, 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 you know, various destinations and it's a great idea and it's a great technology but the vehicles are what got them because they not only had to maintain these vehicles, uh, they had to pay someone to operate these vehicles and those things uh, get expensive and that's my next point which is if you require people to operate vehicles they get expensive um, there's been a lot of hype about not allowing people to operate vehicles 
Let me explain a couple reasons why that's difficult. This is the Metro Green Line, if you've ever been on it. The Metro Green Line, for those who don't know, do not know, is a fully autonomous service. You may have noticed, however, that there is an operator in this train, and there are always operators in, on Green Line trains. And the reason that there are always operators on the Green Line trains is that the labor unions would not tolerate not having an operator on the Green Line train, so it does not operate autonomously, uh, even though it could. And I think that's, again, an example of policy and profit motives uh, diverging, but it is also, uh, I think, uh, illustrative of another point when it comes to having people and why people are important, uh, which, again, uh, if you think about the airline industry, uh, when was the last time you got into a plane and there were no pilots? Uh, it hasn't happened, right? Well, it's not because we don't have the technology. Uh, that's not the reason. Um, the, 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 uh, have you ever been on a plane and you, you're landing and you feel like a little bump or like it's not a smooth landing? You know what that is? That's the pilot practicing landing the plane. That's what that is. So remember that uh, the reason we have pilots in the plane is that if something goes wrong, you probably want to have a human being there, uh, even though the computer 99.9% .9 of the time is going to do a better job. Right? And this, this is um, one of the reasons that the, the, this dream of having autonomous fleets of vehicles, in addition to the fact that you have to maintain the fleet, is uh, not necessarily all that viable an idea. And this kind of is the, is the fifth point, which is the, you know, here's the, the, the autonomous car that, that Uber originally claimed was going to save their failing business model, um, that they were going to use autonomous vehicles. And then, of course, they ran into uh, a person with one of those autonomous vehicles. And they realized that that's where public policy and profit motive might diverge, in that you kill one person with a, an autonomous vehicle, that's going to change the policy very dramatically whereas the 30,000 people who are killed every year with, with non-autonomous vehicles do not change the policy. That is a, a key issue. Um, but if, if Uber had decided to try to operate without people, uh, which they may still try to do, um, and I know uh, Waymo is, is trying to do something similar, they are going to find that the cost of maintaining those vehicles is going to make it very difficult to keep the types of prices that they might have hoped for uh, for those fares. And similarly, you're seeing this with the scooters, right? Because the, the scooters have the advantage of, well, they don't really require uh, people. Um, and they, you know, the, the, the scooters are, are uh, largely, uh, to some extent, a lot of these companies are, are not employing people to move them around. They're, they're, they are paying people to do it, but it's not, not employers. Um, and there's, you don't actually need an operator because the person is the operator in this case, and that's great, but they're still, they still own these things. And they still have to try to figure out how to generate enough revenue from owning them uh, before they fall apart. And they've been really struggling to do that. And all this is, of course, um, being complicated even further by the divergence of policy and profit motive in Sacramento, which recently passed AB5. And for those who are not familiar with the AB5 legislation, it essentially makes it so that uh, you cannot have these things operated by gig economy workers who are just working whenever Uber or Bird or whoever feels like it. You have to actually treat them like real workers and pay them uh, benefits and, and, and give them real jobs, right? And that is a uh, policy objective. You could agree or disagree with whether it's a good one, but it is the law that is widely divergent from the profit motive, which is why Uber uh, and Lyft are saying they will not comply with it. Um, it is why there's going to be a, likely a public referendum on this issue. Um, and, but I think the, the, the point is that uh, I don't see that it's going to be plausible to assume that we can continue to underpay people to operate vehicles as being the way that transportation finally makes money in cities. It just doesn't seem uh, very realistic. So if, you're gonna, if you do not hire people, um, you have problems. If you uh, do hire people, you have to pay them. If you do not own vehicles, you have problems because uh, those vehicles, when they're not uh, owned by the company, means that you have to have someone operating them. So it, it, there's lots of diverging uh, things here that make it very difficult to actually and make any of these things profitable. So I think you're all familiar with the five stages of grief, right? The, these are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, right? So 
I want to talk a little bit about the five stages of new mobility, which are <laughs> not unsimilar. Uh, there's excitement, <coughs> denial, of course, everyone always has denial. Panic, partnership, and merger. So let's start with excitement. I like the, you know, I don't usually use pictures of my kids in presentations, but but I, I love this one. It's such a classic modern photo, right? One kid's reading a book and the other one's got a phone, and what's the kid with the book doing, right? <laughs> Looking at the phone. And I think we are all excited by new things and new technology. Uh, it is a very natural stage, and that is exactly, um, I think, what happened when some of these new mobility providers first started coming out, um, is that we saw a tremendous amount of excitement around these things, right? When Uber and Lyft came in, what a, what a revolution that was. You know, it's, it's, Long ago now that we might forget, but you had a taxi cab industry that was, in most cities, incredibly unresponsive, overregulated, and very, and very difficult to deal with. And all of a sudden, this this new option came along, where you just used a phone and someone showed up and picked you up and took you where you wanted to go. It was really exciting, and it did seem like transportation was being revolutionized, and we kind of take it for granted now. Uh, we really do. I mean, I take it for granted that well, if I'm ever in trouble, I can always just call Uber, right? And that is a, a huge benefit and a, and a real revolution. Um, but the problem is that when we're excited by new ideas and new technologies, it is easy to lose sight of what we're actually trying to accomplish. And that's why I'm going to talk a little bit about the strategic plan, which if you haven't read, I recommend you do. It's called Vision 2028, which is the Metro Strategic Plan that our office helped lead. And it's a 10-year plan for what we're trying to do um, over the next 10 years in Metro. And the purpose of the plan is to say what the goals actually are. And I think one of the challenges with new technology is that it is very easy to get caught up, especially if you're a tech person or if you're a profit-seeking person, it is very easy to get caught up in the excitement of that technology, either the fact that you can do something that's really cool or the fact that you can make money off doing something that's really cool and forget about what you're actually trying to accomplish. And as a government entity, it is really important that we know what we're trying to accomplish. And that's why we have a strategic plan. These are the five goals that we came up with, and I just want to speak to two of them that, are, that I think are really critical for this discussion. One is we want to provide high quality mobility options that enable people to spend less time traveling. So that means um, that our strategic plan, unlike most strategic plans for most transit organizations, is not saying that our goal is to get more people on transit or that our goal is you know, making sure everyone has a safe ride. Not that those aren't things we want to do, but the goal is we want to have better mobility options for people to spend less time traveling, which means our strategic plan is recognizing that these new mobility providers can play a role in doing that. And that we, the new ideas that come out for how to get people around more efficiently and effectively should be incorporated into what we do. Um, and taking that into account means that we're going to look at these new ideas differently than we might have otherwise. Um, I think the initial excitement around these things was, oh, look, these guys are great, and they're just going to provide this new thing, and, and we're all going to have that too. But in reality, it's much more about, well, what does that do to the goals that we're trying to achieve? Does do Uber and Lyft and do the bike share guys, do these guys come out and, and improve mobility? And more, are they providing more high-quality mobility options? And I agree or not. Not an easy question to answer. And then second, this was very influenced by these guys because we said deliver outstanding trip experiences for all users of the transportation system. Think about the customer experience for something like Uber or Lyft compared to the customer experience on Metro. And I, I, obviously, I love Metro. I'm a huge supporter of Metro. Um, but it's my livelihood. It's something I care passionately about. But it is not a good customer experience. Right? It, it, it is typically a bus rider, right? 70% of our riders are on bus. And you typically have a bus stop that is not sheltered. You typically have no information about when the next vehicle is coming. It is not easy to pay your fare if you don't already know how to do it and have a tap card. It's not easy to obtain a tap card. When you get on the bus, the bus is likely to be stuck in traffic. When you get off the bus, you may not necessarily know where you're going. There are so many challenges. Uber and Lyft is so easy, right? You just pull out your phone and it comes and gets you and picks you where you want to go. It is a fantastic customer experience. So what we, one of the things we learned from these guys is we better up our game because if customer experience is important to people, which we assume it is, um, as demonstrated by how many people were attracted to uh, businesses that do a great customer experience. I mean, I can name them. I, I, I love certain businesses purely for that reason, right? CarMax, Enterprise, Amazon. These are places that are laser focused on what your experience is as a customer. And Metro historically has not been. So trying to shift that 
was a, a key part of what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about denial. Because yes, excitement, and so on. what are our goals and how do we accomplish it? But then came the next stage. The next stage was, well, okay, these guys are doing this stuff, but that doesn't affect us. We're, we're Metro, we're public transit. We're, we're not gonna, uh, you know, what happens here is not relevant to us, so we don't have to worry about it. And I think that was a stage that a lot of transit providers went through. Um, this is their thing, this is our thing, they're in a different business than we are. Uh, that is not true, and I think it's illustrated by uh, one of the first partnerships that we put together when we, shortly after I got to Metro, which was met with tremendous resistance internally. Uh, we opened the Expo line in 2016, and when we opened that line, uh, Uber proposed that we partner with them to provide free rides to and from uh, the new station. And we said, that's a great idea, let's, let's go and do that. Um, and the reaction from people within the agency uh, to that concept was, why would we possibly do that? I have no understanding of why you would do that. They considered Uber to be more like Voldemort, right? It was like, why would you partner with these guys? Um, this is uh, unthinkable. These are some of the things people actually said to me. They said, why would we help a competitor, right? This is this you know the, the, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, well, you are ruining everything. <laughs> someone said that to me, um, and, and we cannot legally do this, which may or may not be true, but not the point. Um, so we we actually executed this partnership, and just to give you a sense of how difficult it was, one, one of the people in my office had to physically go out and put up the signs to make this happen because no one else in Metro was willing to do that. People whose job it was to do that were not willing uh, or able or providing enough priority to it. Um, we had to fight with our communications people because they said, you know, we're not allowing you to advertise for Uber on our stuff. And like, well, we're advertising for our customers. We're trying to get them better options, and they, they didn't they didn't like that. Um, so tremendous amounts of denial about the idea that we might want to meet, you know work with these people and that this could be an opportunity uh, rather than a problem. And of course, that uh, once once you have denial, that that does lead to panic, um, and and a, and a panic can be a positive force, however. Uh, because once, it was, once they started to realize, oh, these guys are, are not necessarily going away. They're offering a better customer experience than we are in a lot of cases. They're certainly offering faster travel times than we are in, in most cases. Uh, what is it that we're going to do about this? And thankfully, uh, at the federal level, at least, they came up with something that was quite useful, which was this concept of, well, why don't we do some experiments and see what partnerships with these types of companies might look like. And so uh, we, under this federal grant program, created this partnership with VIA. And VIA, if for those who are not familiar with it, is a uh, ride-hailing company, but unlike Uber and Lyft, they only do shared rides. So you can't, you know, you can't do your own personal uh, limo. And they pay their workers on an hourly basis, not uh, per, uh, per trip. So that's a very big difference. Um, and their business model is much more about partnering with public agencies than about trying to launch into cities and grab market share. They've done that in a few places, not here. Um, but that's really been to demonstrate the technology. And our partnership uh, essentially looks like this. We've got these three zones where you can use a VIA to connect to three stations. Um, it has been uh, 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 it was a very difficult thing to get launched. We've faced a tremendous amount of resistance from within, particularly uh, nervousness on the heart part of our labor unions uh, about doing this. But it has been doing rather well. You can see that our, um, our rides exceeded our, our key performance indicator uh, some time ago. Um, but critically, one of the ways that we achieved that is that our initial fare was going to be um, $1.75. And then you'd have to pay another $1.75 to get onto our trains and buses. This is only for people going to and from the station. So it, you, you, the assumption is you're going to be paying the transit fare. And we were trying to charge a double fare, essentially. And that wasn't working, so we, we made the fare zero. Um, and so now you can use this for free. And since the purpose of this program, again, going back to the goals, um, and just to give you some more data while I, while I talk about this, the, the, going back to the goals, um, the purpose so of this program. Clarify, I think you mean that you pay one fare, not two. Correct. Yeah, yeah you're still not, paying $1.75. You're just not right. Thank you. Yes. You're not paying to use the VIA service. You're only paying for the transit uh, service you're connecting to. But uh, again, going back to the goals, why would we do this, I think, um, is a pretty critical issue. Uh, and you know, the, the reason that we're doing this is that, uh, uh, talking about where policy and profit diverge again, Uber and Lyft, uh, 
are not catering to certain demographics that are core customers for us. Uh, people who are disabled, people who are low income, and people who do not have smartphones. Uh, all of those categories uh, are people who could not and still cannot use Uber and Lyft to get to and from our stations. And since we want to get more people to and from our stations, providing a service they can use is really important. And so that's who this service is targeted for. Because an average person can use Uber and Lyft right now to get to and from our stations. They don't need uh, our help. But people who are disabled, low income, or unphoned, as we say, um, can, uh, can use this. And you can see some of the performance outcomes just from an average week in October. We're really proud of how this has worked out. Now let's talk about partnership. Now I've used my kids again because Kids, in, in very subtle ways, can often tell you uh, really important things. You notice where my son's hand is here? This, this is my older son. <laughs> Not really around my younger son's shoulder. He, they want to have some kind of relationship, but they're not sure. <laughs> they're not sure what it is. And that's really where we are um, in the partnership realm right now, because uh, it's slowly dawning on these guys that they're not going to make money unless they partner with us. And it is slowly dawning on us that we they have a lot of valuable services that they're offering, and we should be doing something. And so that's why we've come up with this idea for microtransit that we're going to be uh, piloting next year. So microtransit is an on-demand uh, service that uses larger vehicles than the typical Uber pool or Lyft line um, and pulls people together in those vehicles. Remember I showed you Chariot and Bridge who went out of business? That's what this is. So we're trying to adopt the failed business model. Now, why are we trying to do that? Well, because that failed business model had some really valuable components to it. One is that unlike uh, Uber and Lyft, we are going to be able to offer a service that is accessible to everyone and meets those public policy goals, right? That's a, that's a key difference. Second is we're going to be offering a service that is publicly provided, which means that our Metro employees are going to be the operators of this service. And that makes a big difference. Because, uh, sorry, that makes a big difference because the microtransit services that were provided uh, privately um, had less of a political stake in them. So if those things went out of business, no one was going to jump in and rescue them because they were purely privately provided. This gives us a little more room for experimentation and it allows us to see whether this model can work under a, 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 what is typically publicly provided, which is a real mass transit focus. And we were negotiating with our, with our labor unions for the last year. We finally got a side letter signed with them uh, last month. And that negotiation was incredibly illustrative and useful and interesting. Because uh, I just want to tell one, one quick story about that, which is that um, <coughs> uh, Metro is a 10,000 person organization. The, uh, about 1,500 of those people are not on the operating side, which means the rest of them are all bus operators, maintenance workers, etc. So they look at us, and we're in a very fancy building in Union Station. They look at us as being these, you know, untouchable people, right? And the chiefs like me are even more untouchable. Like, who is this person? They can't even imagine what we're doing all day in this tall, gleaming office building. But we do this thing called um, uh, SLT Unplug, which is the senior leadership team gets inter or interviews each other. On, uh, and it's live streamed to all the divisions, and people can watch it, right? And I did my live stream uh, interview, um, and when I was done with it, I went to the labor negotiation, one of the operators there said to me, you know, I, I watched your interview, and you're a human being. <laughs> and I said, yes, I, I am a human being. He said, I couldn't believe it. I loved it when you said that if you, that there was one thing you could do in the world that you can't do today would be to dunk a basketball. Because I also wish that I could talk about basketball. And, you know, the fact that I even play basketball was probably something crazy. Like, if this is a person who plays basketball, I thought he was a, just a suit who works all the time. You know, so that really humanized the discussion. Um, and I don't. I'm not saying that that was the breakthrough in negotiations, but it was a really interesting moment for me about what we're actually talking about here, which is people who are operating vehicles who are working with people who are typically sitting in, in gleaming offices and what that, uh, what that can actually produce. And my argument is that a publicly provided version of this is going to produce a way better outcome than the privately provided version. And that's because the privately, I'll get you in a second, the privately provided version of this was trying to make a profit and therefore not trying to accomplish the goals that I articulated earlier. 
and we are going into this eyes wide open that we're not going to make a profit and that our goals are to accomplish these other things, mobility, customer experience, and paying workers. But we recognize there's going to be a cost to that, and the question in our mind is, is that cost worth the benefit that we're going to get? And that's why we're doing a pilot program. Do you have a question about it? Uh, yes, yeah. I have a question about the pilot program specifically. Is this going to have spread all across the potential metro service area, or is this going to be concentrated in specific pockets Similar to the, uh, where you yeah. see potential yeah, so in January, we're going to come to our, uh, our board with proposed service areas. It will not be the entire LA County. It will be sp uh, probably more than one proposed service area we'll, we'll, we'll do in this experiment. Um, what's interesting about how we came to this, um, this partnership is that uh, we, uh, we really went about this in a very different way than I think most, uh, most agencies have pursued it. We put out a contract and said, we're looking for firms who want to design where microtransit should be, what it should look like, everything about the service, provide us with the technology, and then we're going to use our operators, but we're still going to use your vehicles, you're going to provide the vehicles, and you're going to uh, dispatch the service, make it all work. And that's a, an unusual business model. But what we, the reason it was so powerful is that we have three firms that are under contract to design the service. And we may not use all three of them, we may use one, we may use two, we may use none. But they are all incentivized to propose a service that could actually work from what, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. It's a, it's a unique model uh, that I think will allow us to have a better shot at success. So now let's talk about merger. Merger. So this is, because we actually have our arms around each other on this one. Uh, this is a great day uh, where I somehow convinced these children to hike all the way to the Hollywood sign, which I, being a newcomer to Los Angeles, I had to do at some point, right? And, and they did it. I was really impressed with them. Um, this is, uh, when I say merger, much more than a partnership. And that's what we're looking at now. Because partnership is, all right, you've got your business, we've got our business, and we're going to, to work together to come up with a contract. But really, if you look at goal four of our strategic plan, um, we're talking about a much deeper collaboration across this county for what we want to accomplish. Because those who aren't familiar with Metro, Metro has a lot of power in certain ways and very limited power in other ways. There's 88 cities in LA County, and if we want to do anything in any of them, they're going to have something to say about it. Um, they control the streets, which are pretty vital for transportation purposes. Um, so anything we try to do requires some level of collaboration. Um, and so what we're trying to do now is collaborate on what does this future really look like uh, and create this new mobility roadmap. And what does that mean? That means uh, we have a very disparate set of regulations and policies that are governing new mobility providers that have come about for many various reasons that are not because they're the best set of regulations we can come up with, right? So for those who aren't familiar, the CPUC is a state organization. They regulate the ride hailing companies primarily on the basis of safety. They are not interested in whether they're improving mobility or helping equity or reducing emissions. They don't care about that. They care about are they improving safety and they're thinking about it from a statewide perspective. Then you've got 88 cities in LA County who are essentially responsible for regulating those streets that the scooters and bikes uh, and, and, um, and Uber and Lyft vehicles are on. And they've got sets of regulations governing how those things are. Some cities, as you probably know, have banned scooters and bikes entirely. Some scooters, some places like Santa Monica have set up very specific regulations. There's wide-ranging things happening about how we're dealing with all these. Um, and none of them are coming from the place of what are we trying to accomplish and how do we do it across the entire county. Uh, a lot of them have been reactionary. A lot of them have been, um, well, this is just how, how Uber and Lyft lobbied successfully to get it to be done. Um, now you're starting to see cities and LA Metro fight back against that and say, actually, uh, we're, this is our business to make sure that these goals are being met for the county, so we want to be in control of this. That's what you're seeing with the city of Los Angeles as they fight with Uber about data. Um, and that's what you're going to see with us as we start to bring all these players together across the county to discuss uh, what this, this new mobility regulation should look like, who should do it, how it should be structured, um, because that's what a real merger will look like. It's not uh, necessarily the case that um, Uber and Lyft will become part of Metro. I'm not suggesting that. But what I am suggesting is that we are going to be more and more intertwined as time goes on, because they can't make money, and therefore they need public subsidy if they're going to continue to exist. 
And we can't meet our goals without them. Because we can't, we are, well, there are many things public agencies are good at, but innovating and developing new technology on our own is not one of them. We are not going to be the ones who, who come up with the best customer experience for, for on-demand services. We're not going to be the ones who iterate the trip planning app to make sure that it has the best possible available data and customer experience. We're just not going to be do that. That's not our strength. But the private sector is great at that. And so bringing those two things together in the best possible way is really our job. So just to sum up, uh, and I'm happy to take questions for the time remaining, uh, these are the reasons why it's so difficult to make money in urban transportation. Uh, talked a lot about policy and profit motives, why they're widely divergent. Um, the fact that we are subsidizing existing options, the fact that vehicles are expensive, people are expensive to operate them, and if you don't do either of those things, you're not providing transportation in cities. So what should we do? Well, one of the things we're doing is experimenting with various types of partnerships through Mobility On Demand Service, VIA, through a microtransit service that we're launching next year. We're trying to figure out what are the models that work best. It has to be iterative, has to be experimental. Um, because no one knows what the answer is. And if we just presume that we know what the answer is, we're likely to be wrong. Most of the models of partnership have not worked out, right? Either they've been a marketing partnership, where really the transportation network company was just getting some marketing from, from the transit agency, and that didn't really do much to accomplish anything. Or they have been microtransit pilots that have failed, like in Kansas City. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and, uh, and the private providers that have really not worked. So we have to improve on the models that have been out there. And then finally, collaboration um, is critical. And agreeing on what we're actually trying to accomplish is critical. Uh, no one um, in the private sector has to worry about whether they agree on what they're trying to accomplish. They all want to accomplish the same thing. They want to make money. And that's totally fine. Um, the, the issue is that they, that message often gets confused. Because when you hear people from Lyft talk about their goals, they don't say that their goal is to make money. They say their goal is to fix transportation in cities or, or to combat climate change. Um, and those are not really their goals. But saying that somehow is beneficial for their business model. They perceive it as beneficial for their business model. So that's why the public sector has to get together to say, OK, what are our goals? And how do we get the private sector, with their profit motive, to continue to be able to exist and to meet those goals? So we're really hopeful at Metro that we can do this. We think this is a really exciting time for transportation because of all the innovation that's occurred, because of the willingness to experiment, uh, because of the fact that this is uh, a, a, a county in particular that has reached a crisis point when it comes to transportation. Uh, that's probably been said many times before, before I got here. But it certainly feels that way to me because we've got an increasingly inequitable transportation system where it's stratified between rich and poor. We've got an increasingly polluting transportation system where we're, we're killing ourselves with, what we're, with how we're getting around. And we have, most critically, a, a transportation system that isn't going anywhere very quickly, <laughs> which is the original purpose of the system in the first place, and is typically hampered with delays no matter what mode you're using uh, because too many people are trying to use it. So um, the answer to solving all those challenges lies with experimentation, lies with trying new things, because we know uh, what we've been doing certainly isn't working. So thank you so much. Uh, happy to take questions. Okay, I have a question. Okay. Um, so, what is it that Uber and Lyft provide? Why is it so hard for them to make money? So, if uh, if you have uh, if you have the customers and, and drivers, uh, is it is it the fares are too low? Is it that the uh, the the efforts to uh, have broad coverage is problematic? Can, can you break down a little bit? What do you think is going on there uh, uh, to 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 create this hurdle? Well, I think I, I would argue that um, the prices are too low because the interest of the organization, because of their investors, the interest of the organization is much more about spreading the network and capturing market share than it is about making sure that they cover their costs, right? Now, the question is, if they raise their prices, uh, which they are going to have to do if they want to stay in business, 
And they also, at the same time, have to raise their costs because they're, if they're going to comply with the law, they're going to have to pay their workers for more. So if they do those two things, can they still have a viable business model? And I don't know that we know the answer to that, but my guess is that, yes, they can have a viable business model for upper middle class people. And that's very different than having a business model that they have today and will not attract nearly as much investment as what they have today. So um, my, my theory, you know, maybe, I'm, maybe uh, I'm crazy on this, but I, I think is that eventually we'll get to the point where we adopt the model, the new innovations they've come up with as a method of making taxi cabs work better for everybody. And it will be a regulated service that is, to the extent we deem necessary, subsidized for low income people. But that there will be luxury versions of that service that exist for people who are willing to pay that amount that actually can cover the cost. That's my, that's my theory. Yes? Um, like a two-part question regarding the microtransit pilots. So um, one, will it have a similar model to VIA where it will be accessible to those who don't have a phone or in bank? Um, and then two, if the pilot's successful, do you see that working with um, maybe like the, the next gen results um, and then filling in the gaps of wherever the service um, is changed? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, both of those things. So it will have, um, it will have full tap access. So you'll be able to use your tap card to use it, which allows people who are on bank to use it. Um, and it will have a call center just like we have for VIA now so that people who don't have smartphones can use it. Um, that's, those are kind of critical baseline issues that we have to address. Um, on your second point, I think it's really uh, perceptive that you've asked that because it's absolutely true. We are working with, very closely with NextGen to think about where microtransit fits in to our network as we redesign the bus network. Um, it is, uh, I listen, you know, my opinion that, and I think we're seeing this in the data from NextGen, but there are many parts of LA County where a bus running every half an hour um, is probably not a great way to serve public. And it might say, you might be able to say, well, we have service in this area, but it's not a service that's particularly attractive or useful, and it's only for people who are really desperate. Um, and that's not the kind of service we want to provide. So are there places where microtransit could, perhaps for a similar cost, uh, provide a way better customer experience, a way better mobility? And we are looking at that, and I think that it is, it is plausible. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about um, partnerships and mergers. Um, I kept kind of jotting down in my notes, I was thinking to myself, why, why is, is it that Uber and Lyft aren't being nationalized when they're so unprofitable, but they're obviously in such high demand? And I think you have a really good answer to that. Um, I was wondering if, um, if there's any precedent in the uh, functioning of a public utility in terms of a future for Uber and Lyft, that they could be regulated in a similar way. I think that would be particularly interesting just because you know, there, there's a lot about electricity and water usage that is very sensitive information, right? It's data that's very saleable. And obviously, Uber and Lyft have access to that kind of data, and that's probably how they would become profitable in the future, is that they'll start to sell it more aggressively. Um, so I, I was just wondering if you would kind of address this possibility that, it, that they could become utilities and regulated as such. Yeah, it's interesting. The utility model has come up a lot lately as we think about transportation. Um, I heard Michael talk about it as a, as a good example of why we need to charge for roads, right? Uh, we don't give away water or electricity for free and we regulate the use of it, uh, probably through pricing. Um, I think that's a good point. And I, I also have noticed that there is this concept and people call it mobility as a service. I don't, I don't like that term, but there is this concept of could we have a more of subscription type service for our transportation needs um, that allows you to pay in bulk or uh, you know through through less less of an out of pocket cost type of thing like we have now on public transit. And, and the advantage of that um, is that it allows you to better target the subsidies that people who actually need it. Right, the way we're doing transit fares right now. Um, everyone gets $1.75, uh, but not everyone, but $1.75 for some people is a lot, and for some people is nothing. So it's not necessarily a great way to allocate um, the service, and, and the utility model, I think, does pre present 
the opportunity to do that a little bit more easily. Um, but, but I think that the tricky part is when you think of utilities, do you think of innovation? And I would say no. I would say that once you get into a highly regulated environment, um, innovation is much more challenging. And maintaining competitive pressure is critical to fostering innovation. And so that's why I kind of lean more towards the contracting model, because with a contract, you can rebid that contract every few years and, and make sure that, that people are really trying to compete for it in a way that you know I think might be harder to do with utilities. Yeah, Mike? I just want to chime in. I think yeah. that I like that answer. And I would just add that uh, one thing about regulated utilities is that we tend to regulate those utilities that are uh, monopolies, right? There's no real substitute for them. Uh, and they, they tend to provide something that the average person has demonstrated they don't want to do themselves. Yeah. Like we didn't really like heating our own homes with <laughs> chimneys and so forth. Um, and one of the problems that faces Uber is that like they're going into a business where most people have demonstrated they want to do this thing themselves as unpaid labor. They're like, I will drive myself around and not pay myself in a vehicle that I spent money on that I'm very comfortable that depreciates 10% on the year. Like, and I'm Uber's main competitor, and I'm just very happy to lose money. And so, like, if you're competing against a firm that loses money all the time, you will lose money. No, no, that's, I, mean, I think that's a great point. And um, I, I, I think the, uh, the point that Brian made earlier um, is, is relevant as well, right? Because what you're saying is also there's low barriers to entry, yeah. right? So anyone can kind of come in with a, uh, a, a new app, and, and in fact, Uber's business model was, um, there's a great piece about this that just came out yesterday, Uber's business model was to crush all of those people, right? That was, that was essentially what they were doing, is they were very focused on making sure they had dominance over the network, and so Juno went out of business last week, I think, and you know, others companies, that's because that was what Uber was trying to accomplish, and you're right, that they can crush a lot of people, but they can't really crush the, the competition when it comes to people driving themselves. Um, when you speak about uh, micro mobility and micro transit, it's happening in an environment where Metro is building a capital backbone network that will be one of the largest capital investments in the world. And that's certainly not profitable. That's a public investment. It seems to me that the model of individuals using door-to-door -door services to access the system is fundamentally dependent upon this huge capital investment that's taking place as well. Though some people would say, well, if, if we can use Lyft and Uber and it's seamless and it's all over the region, we don't need to build a capital investment. But you didn't talk about the relationship between these innovations and the ongoing capital investment program, and I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, so we, we are, we kind of see our job in, in the innovation office, um, and I think to some extent all of Metro, our job is to remind people that Metro is not just about capital investment, because our board members always focus on the capital investment projects. Uh, even our CEO, because the board members are focused on, mostly focus on the capital investment projects. And it gets way too much attention. Just to give you a quick story that illustrates how this happens. I was with, uh, the, the, for those who haven't met them, the, the lovely individuals of the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association, who, <laughs> who are uh, my neighbors. And they were screaming, if you haven't noticed in the press, about our future plans to build a train from their neighborhood through uh, the Santa Monica Mountains very upset that this could be an elevated train and this would destroy their way of life. And I was in a meeting with them and I said, hey guys, um, how's the traffic now? Uh, because it seems like your way of life isn't so great. I've been to Sherman Oaks. I've tried to get on the 405. <laughs> it is not fun. You sit there for an hour trying to get on the 405 in the morning and people do that every day. Is that working well for you? And, and these guys are in their 60s and 70s. And I'm like, you know, are you really going to worry about this project that you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now might be built? Or do you want to work with us now on figuring out how to solve this transportation problem? And so the reason that I don't emphasize the capital stuff as much is because I feel like our job is to do all the other things. Like, for example, 
we could tomorrow have a network of bus lanes in this county that provided the rapid mass transit that we need without a tremendous capital investment, but we don't because of, a poli of political reasons, right? And if we did that, we would still need to connect to those, those lines with these types of, uh, of new mobility providers. Um, so, um, and similarly in, in Sherman Oaks, you know, instead of focusing on well, what I said to them, instead of focusing on this capital project, well, why don't we talk about ways we can solve this? And when we got together and talked about ways we can solve this, they said, you know what would be really great? Um, how about a bus line on Ventura Boulevard? And I'm like, yeah, that would be great. Uh, why don't we see if we could do that? And and then they said, and then we said, well, what we really wanted to talk to you about is could, what do we think about being part of our congestion pricing pilot? And they said, well, actually, two years ago, we put together a plan for congestion pricing for Sherman Oaks. Would you like to see it? So these are the types of things that happen when you shift the conversation away from the capital projects and towards what can we do now and what are your issues and what how can we work together and. Um, and so that's part of the reason that I de-emphasize them. All that to say, yes, the fact that we're making these major capital investments is a critical part of why we are going to maintain a tremendous monopoly over, over rapid transit in this county and why working with us um, is very attractive to these partners, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Any questions or I I'm not sure. You know, the details, but when you talked about the trend to Dodger Stadium, you said that the company's um, interested in uh, making money from real estate. Would that be like what kind of real estate would that be? Um, I know that around it's pretty well developed around the stadium, um, and yeah, I'm not sure. So, so I don't know because they've not given us those plans, and that's not our land. But the, my understanding is the Dodgers own the stadium, but then another partner owns the, the land around the stadium, okay. and so that's the partner we're working on. So they, they, they believe that if that land was accessible through a tram, that there would be more opportunities for development. Um, I'm under the assumption that venture capital will eventually dry up for these TNCs. Um, and is there, like, unless it's the merger, um, is there any mitigation um, policy for when these companies do go bankrupt? Because, like you said, if they want to survive, they might want to um, have their fares and be a middle class, a, excuse me, upper class service. But the way that functions right now, it's like a lot of people writing it. So what will happen when the service that low income people also use suddenly disappears? And also, <laughs> even though we have like hundreds of years and hundreds of examples of public transport or transportation not being a viable service um, or a viable profit, um, venture, why do people continue to do it? And also, is your office essentially a great neighbor of like taking in everybody's failed ideas and... and you're, you're asking, why do people continue to think that they can make money? And, right. Uh, well, that I can answer. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think that you've, uh, the way, that, what I've been told about how venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are thinking, what they're thinking is not, they don't really care whether you're going to make money, right? They care whether they can get people excited enough about a thing that they can invest a lot of money in it and pull it out before you realize that they're not gonna make money. So that's why they continue to invest and that's why people continue, I mean, people are making money off of these things, right? They're just not going to make money in the long run as a business, those are two different things. So there is uh, there's a perverse incentive going on in our capitalist society today, right now, because of the way that venture capital is seeking investment um, I, I don't know enough about economics to understand why that shift occurred, but uh, there was this shift that occurred where people used to think, well, in order to invest in a business, it has to uh, be able to generate profit, and now they think, you know, in order to invest in a business, it has to be able to look like it could generate profit. Um, so that's, that's an example. Back to your first question, though. You asked about... Like, um, are there any mitigation measures that are... Oh, that right, so when these guys go out of business, yeah. right. So I think that's, that's also illustrated by history very well, right? What happened when, when, when the public transit providers were out of business? Well, government had to take them over and operate them for that very reason. Um, what's happened when private roadway facilities have gone out of business? Uh, same thing, government has had to step in and, and take, it, take it over. So uh, the difference here, though, is that there is an existing service that performs a similar function to Uber and Lyft. It's called taxi cab. And that service is highly regulated and provides uh, more of a living wage 
and does all the things that Uber and Lyft do, except for the part of about being competitive and having innovation, right? And so our job as government is to try to not revert to, let's have a highly regulated industry that is not at all innovative and doesn't serve its purpose, but checks the box, and instead try to maintain some of that competitive pressure. And I don't know that it's easy to do that, but that's our goal. Yeah. Going off of that question, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the mirroring effect we see between TNCs and taxi cabs and the way they operate, there's a distinct difference in that with the way that works are currently classified with Uber and Lyft and the fact that these are privately owned vehicles. What sort of wrinkles do you foresee if it does end up with Metro having to take over operations because Uber and Lyft can no longer actually maintain operations? Do you foresee a potential reclassification of orders if the government continues to fight against things like AB5? Um, and what does this say for the actual vehicle, like vehicles that will be used? Yeah, I don't think we'll be pressured to take over their operations because, like I said, taxis exist and, and cities are largely responsible at this moment for the regulation of taxi cab companies. And so much more likely they would be under pressure to, which they're already doing, by the way, to adapt the innovations that Uber and Lyft have, have come out with to the taxi cab industry. I think that's uh, that's the more likely scenario. Yeah. Right. Just a follow-up comment on uh, a, a couple of the, the, the things you said about taxi cabs. I was interested in your, your future of uh, what you said, upper middle class people using uh, Uber and Lyft. I showed uh, the, those in the class some, some data earlier where we asked, uh, there was a survey of transportation planners asking them who do you think uses taxis? And they thought it was mostly upper middle class people. And who actually use taxis are wealthier people and poor people. Um, and uh, I've also showed them some data looking at lift use in LA County, and we saw very high levels of uh, the shared lift services in low income neighborhoods as well. So that there can be this more U shaped curve where, as Michael pointed out, you know, lots of auto access and ownership less income constraint at one end, but maybe uh, needs for auto access at the other. So even if it evolved into that, there may still be a public role for making sure that there's some sort of access for, uh, you know, either through improved taxi service or, or, uh, right. or um, you know, right now we don't regulate, we don't provide subsidized taxi fares for the most part, things like that. And the only other thing I would mention is you said more of a living wage in the taxi industry because they're regulated by cities, it varies, I, I've, I would submit it varies wildly from city to city whether that's in fact the case. In some, in some cities that, that is in fact the case, in others it's demonstrably not. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning you sort of mentioned the organizational challenges for the Metro and the you know, other departments not really wanting to be told what to do. Um, in first years, I'm wondering if, like, since then, can you speak a little bit more about how you've kind of been able to overcome that and build trust within the agency? Yeah, um, I think we've changed and they've changed. So when we first got there, I think um, we were under tremendous pressure to prove that we mattered and that we should exist. And so we went in guns a-blazing in every meeting and, and tried to really force things uh, down people's throats. And I think that was, to some extent, uh, not a wise approach, but also to some extent a necessity at the time. So it's hard to look back and say, I wish I'd done it differently, but it did. Um, caused a lot of challenges. I think the way that we've changed is that now we um, we rarely do anything at this point where we don't have a willing partner. Uh, we're, we're trying to find willing partners because we have a lot of things we could do. And so one of the criteria for whether we do something is not just whether we think it's a great idea, but whether we can find someone else who thinks it's a great idea. Um, and that's changed. But also, departments are more open to those ideas because they are... Um, seeing that when departments have been open to those ideas and that we've worked with them to do them, that there's a benefit because they're, they're seeing that these things can be successes that they can get behind. So we've, we've won people over in, in that way. Um, but I, now that I'm saying it, I am thinking of just last week where we have this, um, this idea where uh, someone is providing resistance and, and it's one of those things that, that happens in large organizations where you talk to one person in a department and one part of the department, and they're really enthusiastic, and the other person in the other part of the department didn't hear about it, and they hate it, and now we're running up against barriers because of that. And so you're always going to have some of that in a large bureaucracy, but, um, I mean, my job is 100% less stressful uh, than it was two years ago, and 
Uh, my liquor cabinet shows it. So, <laughs> yeah. So I have a question about rigidity and flexibility as characteristics of transportation systems. And I don't mean when I ask this question, rigidity is a negative thing, and agility, flexibility is a positive. So you've got a transit, public transit system that is largely designed around principles of rigidity in a number of different ways. There's the layout, the uh, schedule, and so on. Um, along comes the automobile, which introduces agility and flexibility in a number of different ways, and uh, becomes pervasive almost to the detriment of its, its own success. Right? Fast forward to the past 10 years, and you've got the emergence of you know, rapidly accelerating technologies that enable ride share and ride hailing, PNC, and so on, that introduce a cognition about the uh, uh, excess capacity in the system and allows you to sort of tap into, again, the sort of like agility and flexibility that you didn't have before. So I love the idea of, of this sort of symbiotic relationship between a transit system, which is rigid, and you know, ride share and PNC, which is agile, flexible. But I wonder fundamentally at the core of sort of the institutional arrangement that is uh, LA Metro or any other transit agency that is designed fundamentally for rigid, uh, rigid systems, whether it can simply you know, uh, work with um, these emerging services that are agile flexible, that are sort of operating under very different principles of the sort of core characteristics of that system. So my question to you is, organizationally, you know, LA Metro, for example, um, designed, you know, however many years ago, decades ago, around, right around sort of rigidity and flexibility, what would, or sorry, around rigidity, how would the organization need to change? What competencies need to emerge to ensure that this relationship that you're sort of discussing here is, is possible, is successful, can thrive as the technologies change and so on into the future? Well, obviously, in the Office of Extraordinary Innovation, that's the first step. Right? No, I mean, but I'm serious because the, the, the what you're describing is 100% accurate. Transit agencies, large public bureaucracies are famously rigid for a number of reasons. And transit even more so because of what you described. Our, our basic system is, is very rigid and difficult to change. And that's why the unsolicited proposal policy we have is so powerful because it forces us every week to bring ideas to people and have them tell us why they shouldn't change. And even if we don't take the idea, the fact that they've had to consider what they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it, and whether this might be a better way, is tremendously powerful for the organization. And I'm not aware of any other public transit or public agency that does this to the extent that we do. And I'm hoping that this will be a trend. I can tell you, I talk to people all over the country who are starting innovation offices, who are mimicking the endless proposal. I think it is something that is a very powerful tool for that exact reason that you outlined. I'm not saying that it solves the problem completely, but. Um, when you have to constantly determine whether what you're doing is the best way of accomplishing what your what your goals are, it creates flexibility <laughs> with those with the goals. You have one more question, or we? Gonna... I think we should end and thank Joshua and thank all of you for coming out.